I, for some of you who maybe don't know me, I'm Julie Larson, the chair of the graduate program. And I want to, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I want to welcome everyone to tonight's lecture, uh, which is supported by the School of Architecture as part of our Master of Architecture Design Research Workshop Lecture Series. Um, first, I'd like to just offer uh, the university's land acknowledgement with respect to the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee uh, indigenous people of those ancestral lands that Syracuse University now stands. Uh, so tonight's lecture is part of the grad program's ongoing design research workshop series and is an opportunity for grad students to gain exposure to guest professionals who are invited to conduct in-person workshop and a public lecture here at Syracuse. The workshops provide a view into research design methodologies and how to provide and uh, leverage into emerging processes and practices that lie outside of maybe typical architectural practice and pedagogy. This year's theme uh, for, the, uh, for the, the entire year is art, artificial intelligence, uh, the aesthetic agenda of AI, and how it potentially will change the way we design in the future and how we might materialize AI to enrich our conceptual and aesthetic explorations. This, uh, the culmination of these workshops, oh sorry, Uh, the culmination of the workshops are actually going to uh, end with a roundtable discussion in early April uh, that Corey is actually going to be a part of, uh, the Aesthetics and Future of AI roundtable with a, a, a lot of invited uh, guest uh, lecture, guest, uh, uh, guests to, to be participating. Uh, so be on the lookout for that uh, in, in the coming month. So I'd like to thank the School of Architecture for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, I want to also thank Dean Michael Speaks, Associate Dean uh, Kyle Miller, as well as our staff. Uh, I wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without Deborah and Lori and Christy and Andy. So please, uh, thank you very much for all your support. So tonight I'm thrilled and honored to welcome my uh, very longtime friend, Corey Beige. He is an Associate Professor of Architecture and the AD at University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we both received our master's degree from Columbia a long time ago. I'm not going to say when, um, but <laughs> sometime after 2000. Uh, in 2005, Corey uh, founded uh, his practice, OTA Plus, an architecture design and research office that specializes in the development and use of current new and emerging digital technologies for the design and fabrication of buildings, building components, and experimental installations. Corey uses current uh, design software and CNC tools to both generate and construct conceptually rigorous and formally unique design proposals. Since 2013, he has served as chair of the TXA Emerging Design Technology Conference, co-director of TexFab Digital Fabrication Alliance, and has served on the board of uh, Acadia and co-chaired the annual Acadia Conference, Ubiquity and Autonomy. Uh, Corey has also co-edited Center 21, The Secret Life of Buildings, a book that explores the significance of object-oriented ontology, so triple O, to architecture featuring uh, essays and by leading philosophers and architects. I've been watching Corey's uh, work with AI over the last like year and a half or two years now. I'm just kind of awe-inspiring of what he's been able to produce. He has become really one of the leaders now experiment, experimenting with AI generative tools, focusing on architectural applications with precision and very striking and visual and aesthetic effects. Uh, he was in, interviewed by Design Boom and talk, really talked about how as architects we really should be interested in how form can start to really be gain, uh, we can gain control over form uh, through using AI systems. And this is very evident in a lot of the work that maybe you can see online and some of the work he's going to show tonight, probably, uh, from his Sponge series to some of his Vaulted series, really very provocative uh, work. Um, I think that it's very, uh, it has a very kind of sophisticated approach uh, to some of us who have been maybe trying to dabble in some of this. Uh, I can attest to the fact that it's not easy to achieve the kind of precision and quality that he is able to do already. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome Corey. Uh, he's going to be lecturing today on the elements of an AI architecture. I'm very excited to have him here. Please welcome Corey Beige. Thank you, Julie. Uh, really, thank you for bringing me out here. It's great to be back. I think last time I was here was ACSA. Always lovely to be in Syracuse. Um, 
So this lecture is a little bit different than usual. I usually talk about this, uh, digital fabrication, but AI has sort of taken over the last few years of my life. And so I'm going to try to weave two parallel histories and two narratives together. Um, and I'll start by talking about two different timelines. The first is AI. And I'm not going to go over this in detail, but um, it really started in 1950 uh, with Alan Turing, the Turing test. You probably know this, but that was the test that essentially uh, Alan Turing came up with, and um, the test is if a computer could convince you it's a human, then it's passed the test, and therefore it's intelligent, artificially intelligent. Now, that was 1950. Um, since then, a lot of different developments have happened. Um, you know, all these kind of uh, things until Deep Dream, and it really was a slow, very technical process of development all the way up until about 2014 to 2021. And that's when AI became ubiquitous. So AI started to enter an era where it started to be accessible to other people outside of the technical world that it was um, sort of harbored in. Um, in 2021, Catherine Croson introduced clip guided diffusion, and that changed everything. That's the diffusion text to image models you see, it influenced large language models. All of the kind of work that people are doing now in a very accessible way has to do with clip guided diffusion. And that's when you saw things like DALI, Midjourney, ChatGPT, all of those started to be released in 2021, 2022. And then now we have more and more developments like ControlNet was released. And then just recently, Google uh, Genome, which uh, discovered 200,000 new materials in like a matter of days. So it's really changing pretty quickly. I don't know if you just saw, but also um, they're using AI to, uh, to um, make progress in nuclear fusion as well. So it's really making a lot of real world impacts with, with these kind of models. Um, the other timeline I want to talk about is computational design. This is kind of where I you know, have my, ex my expertise. Um, and it follows a very s similar timeline, but also parallel, so not necessarily connected to AI. And you can see, you know, first computer invented 1821, and Ada Lovelace wrote the first computer program. And then they, you saw the development of 3D modeling systems in the 70s, AutoCAD 1982. But it really wasn't until the 2000s that you started to see building information models. So the connection of a lot of different tools that computational designers were working on in one platform. And this has become, obviously, everyone's used Revit and Grasshopper and these other kind of tools. But this is leading to what I'm calling this kind of convergence, uh, which should happen, I think, in the next year, where the AI tools that we're using start to be combined with the building information modeling uh, tools that we've been developing in computational design for the last 20 years. And I think that at that moment in the next year, NVIDIA is very close already, we'll see a big change in architecture. Because obviously, once you can create um, 3D models within AI platforms that are robust, that are accurate, that have specificity, you can start connecting those to the computational design tools like daylight simulation, structural analysis. And once you can optimize those two things together, you'll produce iterations incredibly quickly. So it's both scary, but also a little exciting. Um, so I want to go back a little bit before that, before uh, the, the uh, text to image models, before the large language models. Uh, there was, of course, artificial intelligence in architecture for a long time. Um, one of the most common platforms was runway machine learning, and it was really a repository of a lot of different tools. So people would create these different models, and then they'd put them on this um, website, and people could use them and connect them in different ways. You've probably seen this. Uh, people were posting images of, you know, draw my portrait in the style of Picasso, and then it would create your picture like Picasso did. That was a style transfer model that was part of runway machine learning. And essentially, it just takes big data sets. All of these models re require huge data sets. And then the model is the actual thing. So style transfer, for example, would be a model. Um, and then interpolation is the new imagery or new text that's created between the, the data set. So uh, these models take the data set and create new images or new models or new images between them or new text between the existing ones. Um, so we did this in uh, the pandemic. Like all other universities, we ran into the, the uh, issue of how do we convey to potential applicants the, the wonderful things of UT Austin without people being able to come to UD, UT Austin and actually experience the campus. And so instead of just creating a kind of Google fly through of the campus, we decided to create a game, but a game that would also have um, speculate on the future of what the campus might be, using our architecture students to create those speculations. And so we used Runway ML and we created a data set with different city grids, different uh, organizational strategies for what a city, uh, a school campus could be. 
And then we mix those with different other organizational systems like cellular uh, plates and biological systems to create a, a data set and a latent space from which to pull and then influence our design. So this is what the students came up with. This is the campus, all the terracotta is the existing campus and all the white stuff is the intervention that came through that data set and through that uh, runway uh, learning model. And these are kind of different interventions. Students then took uh, specific ones and then developed them further, actually turning them into architecture. And so you've got these sort of odd uh, juxtapositions of the existing campus and the new campus. So we create a game out of this and people could go online and walk through campus. We had a whole bunch of surprises. Um, if you, it was like a scavenger hunt, if you uh, got the correct number of uh, answers in certain spaces, you'd win a lunch with Matthew McConaughey, that was the biggest prize. <laughs> and then Kendra Scott was another one. And so students got really involved in it and actually kept people pretty active in the campus. So I think it was an exciting kind of thing that then uh, you know, lasted for about two years. Um, so that brought us to diffusion-based text-to-image AI. So this is all of the stuff you're seeing now, mid-journey, DALI, stable diffusion, open AI. Um, and this is based on a very different strategy of uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning. With diffusion-based AI, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but I'll run through it really quickly. You type in text, any text you want. The text can include uh, the architecture or the thing that you want to create. It could be a landscape, it could be a graphic design and then qualities of it, anything uh, including views, aspect ratios, anything you can think of you can put in the text. It then runs through this cloud of pixels, so um, mid-journey, all these text-to-image diffusion models uh, create basically a no noise field of pixels uh, that are randomly generated, and then it assembles those into features based on that text. So here you can see it actually working, it's assembling the picture, uh, pixels into features, and those features correspond then with the uh, text that you put in. You then go through a series of upscaling variations, and every time you upscale, you increase resolution, which means increase pixels. And so it looks back at your prompt and it adds more of that information in. So it continues to develop, and I think that's why like mid-journey was originally called mid-journey, because you really do go on a journey, you upscale and vary. To the point where early on you create 10,000, 15,000 images in order to get something that you know, match the results you were looking for, or where something emerged that was unexpected and also exciting. So it's gotten to be a much shorter amount of work required to get to that place, but it still uh, requires a lot of intervention of the author in order to achieve these kind of outputs. Um, you know, after upscaling variation, you get things like this, vault structures. And I would argue this is what we've always been doing, at least 50% of architecture disciplines. Um, this is an image Colin Rowe, Fred Cater, uh, from Collage City. And this is back in the 50s. I have to use it because they're Texas Rangers from UT Austin, and that's when they came up with this. But um, the idea essentially was against modernism. This idea that modernism would wipe out a, a block and then start from a, a, a tabula rasa and then build a, a modern building. They were looking at cities as these organisms that would develop as a collage. So heterogeneous assim assemblies of building layers city layers, street layers, that would then connect in a way that that, um, that that difference was expressed as opposed to wiped out. Of course, Robert Venturi, uh, a similar approach with a difficult hole, um, in, uh, in their book, Venturi and Scott Brown, uh, their book, where they talked about, and this is a project for the National Collegiate Football Hall of Fame, where they talked about these heterogeneous elements coming together, and then through those differences would find some synergy and some, some kind of interesting assemblage where these parts would gain new, new meanings. Um, and so collage, this is a form of collage, but not quite a collage. This is Antoine Picon at the Last Acadia, and that's actually one of my images. And he's talking about collage in this new environment. It's something that's not necessarily discrete elements, but the melting together of an assemblage of things. And that's really what it is. It's allowing for uh, more like a chimerical being, you know, like a, a fawn, a human, where things still retain their original um, kind of difference, but they blend together together in a way that is not uh, as articulated as two things just against each other. And um, so that's sort of where we are in this workshop that I'm, I'm doing now. We're looking at the elements of architecture. And I would argue it's always good to look at the elements of architecture when these new kind of ideas come along. Um, this is from uh, Rim Coolhouse's book for the Venice Biennale in which uh, he was looking at the elements of architecture, breaking architecture into its discrete elements, floor, ceiling, roof, door, 
etc., and then focusing on each of those. Uh, in this case, we can also use those features within these AI environments. We can look at new hybrids that go beyond architecture, so not just walls and architecture elements, but other architectural other elements that are not architectural within the environment you can fuse with those, and that's sort of what the AI is doing. So you start getting these um, entities, these, these ducks in this case, that are not quite, they're duck-like, they're not quite ducks, but they start exhibiting architectural properties. Um, you start getting material that melts into facades, and these uh, qualities start to blend with, with actual features of architecture, actual um, real elements of architecture. Um, in this case, the the sponge series I worked on where uh, using uh, the concept of a sponge would actually replace one of the housing units and then it would, uh, instead of just overcoming everything, it would be um, exist within the collage of the other parts. And so this is kind of idea that I've been working on for a while, which is this idea of the emergent collage. And for me, it's always really important that the author is still involved in this process. So I'm not interested in giving up the authorial role in any design process, but allowing for these two uh, the tool to also coexist with the author and to find a, a kind of hybridity between those two roles that produces something new, something emergent that you wouldn't typically plan for within the design process. So in this case, um, I created the initial image in the center and then I outpainted everything else. And this is very early on, this is maybe two years ago, using Dali, um, asking Dali to create what exists beyond the frame of the image I've created. And this is the world it came up with. It's, 1980s you know, colorful world, um, but you start seeing these features emerge the process that are not part of what you initially um, assumed would result. So you get these kind of structures, pavilions start to emerge, even these sort of cityscapes and, and urban organizational patterns start to emerge. Um, and this can go, you know, you can either do kind of, depending on how, um, how much you ask AI to produce, you can either have it produce a whole lot in which case it references your words and, and text a little bit, or you can ask it to produce very little, and you can start to incrementally grow your designs, um, but have AI look at what you've already done and then use that to create that growth. And so this image uh, is actually gigantic. It's about 40 feet long, and it's 300 dpi, so it's a very high resolution image, all outpainted, and nothing is repeating. So it's an entire endless city that just continues to grow and, and use, um, its own nature and its own kind of sensibility to uh, almost like a large language model predict what it should do next. And so it grows through that prediction. And so these are, these are you know, techniques we've used for a long time in computational design. Um, two in particular, one is the, the uh, algorithmic design, which is essentially the core of computational design. And that's not to be meant to be digital, so I think there's sometimes a confusion between algorithmic design and computational design in digital, or, or I guess the computer. Uh, Saul Witt, I would argue, is a computational designer, even though he did not use the computer. He's definitely an algorithmic designer. Uh, he's an artist who would create a rule set, so this would be a Saul uh, drawing. And his art is just the rule set, so he would uh, establish the rules for the art, and then a curator or a team would actually create the art. So uh, this is a member of the Blanton Museum of Art, and they're installing a solo wit. So he's not even there. He's, 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 uh, all, the only thing he provides is the instructions, and the instructions are then purchased by the museum and carried out by the staff. So it's this idea of algorithmic design where the authorship is really in the process. We did something similar with a project with my students at UT. This is the Onda Wall, and um, we essentially created a bunch of processing scripts to create emergent patterns. So looking at um, uh, Perlin noise patterns, different algorithms that create randomness, and then looking for emergent conditions that would come from those algorithms as we start to overlap them and connect them. So this wall is entirely designed algorithmically. Uh, nothing is, um, nothing is uh, designed like in situ, so it's all from the computer. And you start seeing these different shapes appear through those algorithms. So these kind of star shapes start to appear, and all of that is emergent through the process. And that's really what we're looking for. The other path is the evolutionary design. So in evolutionary design, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but you essentially have an initial form, you add variation to that form, and then through multiple series of iterations and variations and selections, you end with the final forms that best match whatever uh, condition you're trying to achieve. 
Uh, and that's a really simple way to do it. But we've used this a lot in our practice, but also in the computational design field. Uh, and this particular project, which I think exhibits it pretty well, um, this is a house that we finished or designed in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, it's a little bit outside of Albuquerque, and it's uh, separated from the um, city infrastructure, so there's no sewage or electricity, so it's an entirely off-grid house. But the clients weren't interested in off-grid looking house, they didn't want an A-frame. So we had to create a new kind of formal language that could apply uh, to the site, but also would be an off-grid, so it still has sustainable attributes to it. So to do that, we created a, just a huge catalog of forms using this evolutionary design process just creating um, kind of parametric conditions that could be adjusted and altered. And then once we had literally hundreds of, the, of these things, we would add variations to them to create offspring. And then we'd look at all of these different forms and variations and start to connect them together using this network. And this is not so different from how AI currently works. You add variation, you select, and then these things get tied together uh, through these diffusion models. In this case, we were doing it through this mapping that we created, but it's not so different, I think, as a process. And so we take chunks, pieces of each of these, and we start combining them based on what attributes of each piece best matches the map, and then those fuse together to create the architecture. And this is pretty old, but um, that's sort of the result of that process. So first experiments in AI, we are looking at these building elements. We are looking at facade chunks, stair chunks. How can we start to rethink all of the elements of architecture and isolate them and then start to recombine them into building, um, to full buildings, full architectures. And so we looked at facades. We also looked at different ways in which to represent these things. So looking at rendered quality, photographic quality, model quality, qualities, and then how each of those might express the architecture, the elements differently. Um, and so we looked at different facade strategies, um, small vaulting strategies. And this is very early. This is like. Uh, beta, so like two and a half years ago, uh, working in the summer. Um, so these are some of the first outputs that were really out there in the, in the, in the Instagram world, um, looking at different kind of natural vaulting structures, how biology might fuse with architecture, how you can create architecture, canopy, stairs, all of these elements can be uh, using very similar prompts, uh, create a family of similarities between different element types. So again, really quick images. And then you know, this got pretty expressive and we started to create these really pretty lush interiors, things that would be very difficult to model otherwise with, with the current digital software technologies. So I think that was pretty exciting at that point. But of course, I'm an architect, so uh, gaining some control over the form and the output is critical, I think, when you're working with these technologies. You don't just want to type in some text and then output it and that's done. So we are looking for different ways in which we can control the form of the output. Of course, Everyone knows the shape of letters, and so we created an entire alphabet of, of letters. And it really had to do with this poster. We were working on this poster at the time, and we couldn't get the letters right. And it does do graphic design. This was entirely designed in mid-journey. Um, but we couldn't quite get the letters and articulate those. So we did a whole series of, of experiments trying to gain control over those forms. Uh, this is a project by um, Yasuki Ozawa is just looking at uh, aerial views of buildings and creating an alphabet of that, so I thought that would be a good idea. It's not foreign to architecture. People have done this for a long time. Simon Ungers, shop architects, uh, Jurgen Meyer, Matt architects. So people have been using uh, letter shapes uh, to control architecture for a while. So that's sort of what we were doing with this experiment. We created an entire alphabet. Um, what was interesting about this is that the aspect ratio did control a little bit the uh, ability for the letter to, to exhibit variation. So if you had a square, you would always get a letter with a very particular outline, that, like the C would just be a C. There would be nothing beyond the frame of the C. But as soon as you change the aspect ratio, it would start to introduce new elements. You'd start to get these kind of uh, connecting elements. You can still read the legibility of the C, in this case two Cs, but you would start to get other architecture connecting between them. And that was really exciting for us. Uh, we made D, you know, every letter in the alphabet, looking for those. And then we started to connect these letters into words. So uh, not necessarily words that meant anything, but looking for different shapes that created different architectural conditions, like courtyards um, or entryways. And so we used letters to control that form uh, as a kind of architectural experiment. Then we created more of these, started to turn these into three-dimensional models, and just did very quick architecture projects with them. So this is 
taking that, uh, that uh, image that we created in mid-journey, turning it into a house design in Austin. Uh, and this is like a you know, two-hour experiment. Uh, and just looking at the different kind of qualities we could get using that uh, workflow from AI to, to a real Rhino model. Um, there are other ways to control form. So another thing we were looking at is using pattern to control form. In this case, uh, camouflage. We all know what camouflage looks like. You know, it's, it's green and brown and, and kind of uh, organic shapes mixing together. Uh, so we thought that might be an interesting way to control form and actually puzzle form together. And so we started with these early prompts and pretty much produced what you'd expect, you know, kind of uh, a canvas uh, or a wrap around the building that had camouflage qualities, but it wasn't really influencing the architecture so much until you go very deeply into it. So this is after maybe 7,000 iterations of curating the model, upscaling, uh, forcing it in certain directions uh, to the point where greens became plants, uh, white became glass, and tan became limestone. And so actual materiality started to be introduced into the project using that camouflage pattern as the initiation for it. And so you start getting these kind of really interesting architectures with some level of control. Uh, some recent experiments, so I, I like to kind of look back at where we were and, and where we are now. And uh, that was the very first image I ever made. That was in, in June 2022. I just did this one just to see the you know, exact same prompt, what it would produce. Really simple prompt, house made of dinosaur bones. And you can see that there's a big difference in the realism, the articulation of elements. It still has a kind of house quality, but you also lose something with the more recent models as well. And this is something I, I can't really stress enough, which is it's not necessarily a development where you, uh, like in a software where every iteration introduces new tools and they should be better and the program should work better. These are just different tools. So every time there's a new release, it's just a different uh, way that it, um, that it slices the data set, different way that it accesses the data set. And it produces uh, sometimes much cleaner, much more articulate images, but also sometimes less interesting images. So one thing we've been doing quite a bit of is um, moving through the models. So we might start with uh, Mid Journey 6 and then we'll move into Stable Diffusion all with the same imagery and just let the image develop by going through these different iterations and these different models. We sometimes even take an image we started in the latest version of Mid Journey and then we move it into version 2 of Mid Journey and then into 4 and then Stable Diffusion and you can see that it picks up some features that are, are, are um, specific to each of the different versions and it starts to aggregate those in a way that you couldn't do otherwise. You couldn't do just by typing text and hitting go. It actually gathers different features along the, the kind of path. So you get these kind of interesting um, hybrid models that some sometimes are um, articulated uniformly, but sometimes you'll see elements that are super articulated because they came from Midjourney 5 and then other elements that are a little more pixelated and fuzzy that may be more interesting that start to attach from Midjourney 2. And it just starts to develop this kind of, I think, unique quality. So these are some of the more recent ones that we've been doing. Um, you know, we do like to uh, mix different infrastructural elements with the architecture. So in this case, looking at skateboarding ramps and how those might fuse with architecture. We're usually looking for um, strategies that would be difficult to do otherwise without the tool. Uh, so introducing, you know, non-architectural conditions in the architecture and hoping that that guides the development of the architecture, but also um, using uh, artists as, as the inspiration or a mixture of artists and architects. One thing I never do is just say design in the style of Zaha Hadid. Don't do that. <laughs> It'll look like everyone else is out there, but you can start to mix artists and architects. So what if it's designed by Zaha Hadid and Renzo Piano and Kengo Kuma? Suddenly you have this interesting hybridization of different design styles it would be very difficult to achieve otherwise, I think. So we do that sometimes with graphic designers and architects, combining the two to see which elements start to fuse and how they fuse together. So this would be, uh, I think we use David Carson, a graphic designer, uh, with some key terms, and then a very kind of uh, conventional modern architecture. And you start to see them fuse in different ways. So sometimes it becomes just graphic, sometimes it becomes a planter, sometimes it becomes the architecture. And that's where the curation really becomes critical and why you shouldn't just rely on you know, hitting enter once and then being happy with it. But you can really find a lot of interesting territory if you pursue it further. 
Um, so some other kind of architecture created that way. Uh, but there's a lot of models out there, so I'm only going to cover just a little bit of them. But that's your typical you know, text to image diffusion model. But there's a lot of other stuff happening, and things come out every single day. And really, the combining of these is really interesting. So uh, in DALI, for example, you can drop in an image of something you've done. It could be a rendering, it could be a photograph of a building. In this case, I designed the building in the upper left. It's a house in Missouri, and that's a real photograph of the house. And then DALI gave me hundreds of different iterations of that house. So you can see it's in the same style, same material materiality, but different composition of elements. So it's a great way just to test composition of your design and iteration of the design. This could be a rendering, could be an actual photograph, and you can see variations very quickly. So that's been pretty interesting. The um, sketch to image is another kind of emerging um, tool where you can just you know, very quickly, I did this on my phone and, um, and sketch this out, and then you bring it right into these models and they create architecture. But also you can start blending architecture. And so this, uh, I did a whole series where you start connecting uh, images that I created in mid-journey as singular images, but then combining those and blending them together. And this, again, is where you start to deviate, I think, from just standard use of AI, because those two images, although they were created with a prompt, you start blending these together, and that can never be repeated again, unless somebody knew what seeds those were and how to combine them. But you start going into territory that is non-repeatable. And I think that's really important. I think it's interesting um, as architects to be always aware of what you're doing that um, is something that just becomes a process versus something that you actually have control over. Uh, but also to allow things to emerge that you wouldn't typically expect. Uh, so one thing that we've been doing is looking at precedent analysis using AI. Um, and so AI has, reads images in a way that's very different than us. Of course, we're all trained as architects, so we know how to analyze a precedent, understand this, the composition of form, circulation, structural analysis. AI, of course, understands imagery in a very different way, and that can also be a benefit to us. And so we took a few of our projects. This is Plume, which is a public art project we just completed in Austin. Um, it's essentially a, a 3D printed core uh, that's a structural carbon fiber matrix that's wrapped in a bunch of aluminum rods, um, about 15,000 aluminum rods. If you're in Austin, come check it out. Uh, but we were interested in uh, creating a family of new design iterations that were generated by AI, but using our style. So instead of using other style of architects, actually creating what, what would, how would AI understand our style as architects, and then how could we use that to, to create new designs using the kind of strategies that we already include. So we um, took this project. We also took another project called LumaFoil, which wasn't built, uh, but was a canopy that we designed for uh, the FIU School of Architecture. This is a Bernard Schumi building. Uh, we designed this canopy for, for uh, this building, looking at different uh, ways of, of creating form and daylighting, uh, 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 shading the canopy from, from the sun. Um, and it essentially was a cellular structure, but we only got to this point where it's a rendering. So we thought, what if we start to combine, uh, use AI to analyze the rendering and the photograph, and then create a hybrid of these two? Can we do it? And so we asked AI, this is before um, Midjourney actually introduced a tool that does this automatically, but we used some other site called Hugging Face to um, analyze these and tell us what text you would use to produce those images. And it's not what you think. It's not how I would have described it. It's not the terms I would have used. But there's some pretty interesting ones in there. So for example, Texas Revolution is what it came up with. Um, dimly glowing crystals, Selena Perez, the singer. I mean, things I never would have associated with our architecture or the design uh, is what it gave back to us as tags within that data set within the prompt. And so this is the output of that, that text without any editing, no modifications, just plugging it back in. And I would say it's a pretty good hybrid of those two projects, which, you know, I think there's something interesting about that. So you can certainly see elements of plume and lumafoil um, within this, this um, design. So that's one of the things we're looking at. We're also really interested in this kind of idea of world building, which um, it goes back to the initial emerging collage idea where we can actually generate uh, the material outside of the image that we create within Midjourney using outpainting. And so here's a perfect example of how varied uh, the world AI understands outside of the world that it creates can be. 
So in this case, we started with this very little image um, right here, just this little piece. And we um, outpainted to see in very slow increments of outpainting so that it looks, it, it maintains the same resolution and looks still of the same world as the initial piece. If you outpaint too quickly, you'll get like the 80s pop world that I did in my first one. But if you go very slowly, it'll maintain the quality and articulation of the image. And so we did that a few times. So we did it here with this one, and that's the kind of world that it came up with. This is a different outpainting with the same initial image. You can still see down here, that's the exact same piece, but totally different result. And then a third one, um, also with the same piece, you can see tiny little one way down there. And these are gigantic. This is about a 30 foot image. So you can see we outpainted uh, quite a bit, you know, hundreds of times um, to get to this point. But, uh, and then, you know, other kind of features you might find, like it actually will reveal context when you do that. So in this case, you know, we started with a little image in here, but then it, it outpainted into this, I don't know, Chicago or, or some, uh, some city, which was not part of the original image, which is always kind of interesting. Um, we did this with a bunch of buildings to look at different uh, parking garage structures that would also engage some kind of mixed use uh, set of sort of projects. So these are all outpainted from very small seeds, um, and a lot of them using the exact same initial element. So essentially a family of iterations from the sa same initial um, uh, form. But you can see it's gotten much better than it, than it used to be. So again, this is a huge image. I think the original piece was, was only that big. Everything is out painted from there. Um, and so that's led to this whole uh, strategy of developing seeds. So not developing images in Midjourney and Dali, not final images, but actually creating these kind of seeds from which we could grow much larger, much more expansive AI contexts and imagery, hoping that there are moments within that expanded space that might point to something emergent or something that we could use within our own architectural practice. So we created a bunch of these kind of plazas and, and what I'll call seeds, and then generated larger territory, larger urban projects, all from those uh, really spanning city blocks, even, even whole city neighborhoods, and even creating entire cities out of these um, very large things. So I think in this one, our initial seed is maybe like that big. And so the whole world out of, outside of that is, is generated through this um, curation of that expanse. And this is even further out. And so uh, in, our, in the workshop I'm teaching here, like uh, a week ago, I started a few images with the students, as some of you I think are here. And I just, uh, on the plane, you know, expanded those to see where they would go. And these are a few of them. So this is just a few days ago. And I think the initial image was pretty small in the center. And then some of these are really becoming, you know, almost pattern, kind of like a, a game of life pattern uh, to them. which. This is a little bit different than, than um, the other ones I've been working on. So, uh, of course, what's interesting about this AI work is that uh, it can be hybridized into different approaches. So I've actually uh, used it now in two different projects. Um, so uh, combining, of course, the artificial intelligence work with, intelligence work with the design digital fabrication work. Uh, one project uh, I completed in Calgary with a bunch of students this is a very quick workshop that I know Julie also did. Um, it was essentially you know, four days of a really extensive effort by the students, and we used AI to generate the form and different uh, machine learning algorithms using the letter idea to create the geometry, so stacking letters in different ways. And so we did that very quickly, but was, what was really interesting about this project, I think, was creating the graphic and creating the, the uh, exterior surface of the project. So um, the form was a stack of letters, uh, pretty standard fabrication techniques. And then the exterior unfolded surface uh, was all in-painted. So the opposite of out-painting, where you're looking at the exterior territory, this is uh, like Adobe's generative fill, where you can erase part of an image and ask AI to fill that in. So this was before generative fill. Uh, but they were using um, DALI to actually in-paint the image on the unfolded surface. And so they create a whole bunch of, of base images from which it could pull from, and then just let loose, and it created very strange things, like all these uh, kind of graphics and some text. But what was nice is that it, the, the graphic and the text was responding to the actual form of the geometry. So it understood where corners were, it understood where edges were. It wasn't just a, a wrapping of a kind of field of graphic. It was actually tuned 
to the actual geometry. So this was the sort of output of that. Um, the other thing we're working on, this is a current project in my office. Um, we just launched a new thing called Plume Design Lab, and we're using AI pretty extensively uh, to work on product design for a company in Austin. And um, they're moving very fast. And so just to speed up the process, we used AI as an initial kind of generator. But it's really fed a lot of these different strategies. And the idea of the project is to create products that can adapt to any space. And so an architect might have a space that's one shape, a ceiling that's one shape. And whatever shape it would be, they would send that with all of the RCP, so the sprinklers, the lights, the, you know, any element that might be in the ceiling. And then this would adapt you know, parametrically to those conditions. And we're doing not just like five products, but hundreds of products. And so to achieve that level of variation and, and uh, a catalog that big, we've used AI to generate initial sampling of different ideas. And so these are just some studies we've, we've created. But we've translated those now into, um, into Grasshopper. So we're using those exact forms and features. and. We're starting to create a bunch of different grasshopper models that essentially can overlap and layer with each other to have really interesting kind of connections and and hopefully through that superimposition you produce uh, some emerging qualities as well. So these are just a few of the ones we've been working on, um, a few of the kind of overlapping patterns. And this is very new, so like literally a few days ago <laughs> we started doing some more of these. And you can see we have, we're testing it three different ways. So we have a very small, this is a physical model, a 3D printed model uh, that's about the size of the projector. And then we have a really huge model that's a three inch to one, uh, three inch equals a foot model. So we're going to test prototypes of each of these uh, assemblies. And then we're actually building the thing. So that's the big model. And now we're in the prototyping phase where we're really just testing the machinery and seeing how we can adapt these models and output bespoke unique designs for any client, but using these kind of uh, models that we've already created. So this is really early on. Uh, this is some of the prototyping that's happening right now. Um, we're also with that developing different uh, pattern logics that are coming from AI. So this is uh, also in Grasshopper creating a pattern strategy. And we're using the patterns and the imagery to control the parametric output. So it's not necessarily a bottom-up approach that we're kind of used to with Grasshopper, but it's a top-down approach. That, and the top-down layering of this imagery is actually controlling the, the, in, the, the kind of bottom-up logics of the, the scripts. And this is, uh, we're just about to finish this one. Um, it's a hallway wrapper out of metal that we're doing right now. It's about a 40-foot hallway. And so, um, you know, with that, we're kind of creating these infographics to explain to clients. Every everyone here probably understands parametricism and how you change the shape of something and then it, you know, changes the parts. But um, we're creating this logic uh, so that we can convey these ideas to to um, clients. And so, doing a whole bunch of different patterns. So that's where we're at now. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the the next few days of this workshop and seeing what we come up with. Thank you. Are you up for a couple questions? Okay. I'll give, I'll give everybody a chance to think of something. <laughs> and I'll start. Um, thank you so much, Corey. Uh, it's fantastic to see. I just uh, kind of soup to nuts in a way to like get a, a sense of where you've been at knowing your work already. but understanding like how you're kind of translating it it's really really remarkable I'm I'm, uh, I'm curious about like I like your, uh, like your way of describing some of this later work where you're talking about it as an evolution and that it that there are these kind of emergent ways that it's it's that you're trying to develop it so that it, that there is like an evolution truly an evolution to the work now obviously there you're kind of uh, collaging a lot of these things together and one of the kind of um, in order to start to see something new emerge from it um, and I think that's one of the conversations that has come up quite a few times um, with some of the texts that Mark Linder gave the students early on and just how how to kind of approach this like how much is it uh, a regurgitation versus like an evolution and, and I think you know 
I don't know if this is a way to answer that, but like in terms of how you see this growing, <laughs> uh, even beyond what you're doing now or what you hope for, for it to happen. I don't know, is, what do you, where do you see that growth and that kind of um, uh, emergence gonna really gonna take you? What are you hoping to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I've always liked collage as a, as a technique in the design process to hopefully find something new, but you know, typically when you collage, it's still you that reads the elements in relation to the other elements. And so you're sort of inferring um, relations between things as you collage them. I think what's great about this, these new tools and techniques we have is that, yes, you still infer and read into the collage and can read differences between things, but also the computer is generating new information within that that you wouldn't typically get in a collage. It's something that you would bring to it, but now, the computer and you are both bringing those two elements. And so I found, I mean, I, f I found that it, because you curate the model so much, it, it, not that it understands you, but it, you, you're you making choices within it and it's it's now predicting those choices and it's making, um, uh, it's creating results that I think match better the kind of choices you make. And so it does in a way become a collaboration. It feels like one anyway and that uh, it gives something to you and you give something back to it and then it develops in a way that I think is very different than a one directional approach that I think collage might typically be. So for me, I'm just hoping that I, create, I can find new things within these architectures that um, relate to the interests I have, but also are revealing something new that I might, a new direction I might take. Thanks, Corey. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm thinking about moments of like significant change within the discipline of architecture that map to changes in mathematics and numbers, essentially. I'm thinking about Mario Carpo's argument that it moves from like whole numbers and fractions at one point to calculus, and then that is like a new way we think about numbers, and then when Architects get access to calculus-based form through software in like the late 90s. Like that's a big, a big shift. And there's a way in which all of these images are just like, they're mind blowing. I still, it's, I know it's been years. Also, the timeline is funny. It's like years ago. It's like two years. Yeah. And it's like decades ago. So there's like a weird um, acceleration of time happening too. But since they came out, like I think they're awe-inspiring. And I appreciate the effort to kind of converge the AI image work with fabrication, but it makes me wonder just about like when these images turn into numbers, which turn into code that feeds a CNC machine or whatever, that it starts to feel like a little bit more familiar just because those tools have been around for a little bit. But I'm wondering, like, is there a kind of like change in the way that architects control like math or numbers that will allow this stuff to move into physical form in a way that, like, do you sense that there's something yeah. afoot in, yeah, in that I, space? Yeah, and just to be clear, we are not there yet. I, I would not. I know other people argue oh, yeah, we're already doing it. No, we're not. I think it's actually you know a few years off at least, and. So I think some of like the last two projects I think are predicting ways that they might come together, but still heavily influenced by my own knowledge and expertise in certain areas. Um, I'm really curious, you know, I think we have to be ahead of it and sort of understand, create the model for when it does happen, how it might fill that model, fill that, that process. And so that's sort of what I think we're trying to do is create the elements of what that process might be and then forcing them but I think eventually they won't be forced. I think it might start to fill in those spaces. Um, so that's part of it. Mario Carpo actually was at UT Austin two weeks ago. We, we gave a lecture about it. And, um, interestingly enough, I think we we're on a very similar uh, page in terms of the potential and also maybe the pitfalls, but we, I think the potential really in her, his mind, but also mine, was the ability for uh, an overlap of I guess we call them precedents. Design styles, different qualities of design um, that was not previously possible because I think of the technology and the way that it constructs an image and the way it will construct 3D, which will also be similar to the way it constructs images. 
It constructs them by assembling pixels into forms and then shapes and then assigning qualities to those and so forth. Once it gets into 3D, it'll be the same. It'll be pixels, point clouds, assembling into geometries, which then can be tested. But to your calculus point, because it's um, points and not lines or surfaces or lofts, it allows a different kind of mixture to happen that allows for an overlap that is not based on objects. It's based on gradients. And so that's kind of interesting, I think, where suddenly you have a gradient and you know, what's interesting also, like it doesn't, um, AI wants to create resolution. So it doesn't want to create gray, you know, or brown. It doesn't want to just mix everything evenly. It wants things to still be articulated in that field, but it allows for that fuzziness to happen because of the, the mathematics of the way it's assembling these things. And so I think in that territory is where you get really interesting overlap of things that still have discreteness and identity, but actually start to merge with other things that also have their uh, so I, I think maybe there's something in that pixel that, that's different than the calculus that we're used to. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I'm in the Direct of Research with Mark and Emily, so this is really helpful to see, especially like with the use of the different multimodalities of AI. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting was how you said that there's like a hybridity of using these AI systems. And a question I guess like my group has kind of been confronted with is like how much agency do we give AI or how much human input do we give to these AI systems? And like especially because there is no like right or wrong or like I don't think we can necessarily say what's correct about these like AI images or not. I was wondering how much human input you tend to put into these AI systems and if it's more about the process that you kind of drive the AI or do you kind of pick out which elements you like the most? So yeah, great question. Uh, two, two things. I think first we still have to be critical of everything we produce. I mean that's what any kind of design discipline, artistic discipline, the critique is as important as the production, I think. And so no matter what AI makes or what we make or what you make or what I make, we should talk about it, be critical of it, understand the, uh, the, the potential of it, the, the qualities of it. So I still think that's for sure part of the process. Um, I think you can judge if something's right or wrong based on criteria that you agree on or that, that a project might require. So I think a lot of the stuff, the way we analyze things still holds true for AI and for architecture, no matter how you produce it. Um, the other thing, which you know, there's an interesting, it's like a side discussion uh, the, that we had on some chat forum with one of the founders of Stable Diffusion. And they were, they're wa they watched, you know, especially in the early days, watched what people were producing. And I don't know if it's true, but this is what they said. Um, the best artists produce the best art, the best architects are producing the best architecture. And so, you know, there's this idea that anyone could go in and start typing things and produce amazing results, but that's not necessarily true. And I think it's not true because all of the knowledge you gain in school through in being in the world is all knowledge that you then put into how you curate the model and also the text that you put in the prompt. And so if I were, you know, I am a teacher, so I, I ask my students to lean even more into history, even more into theory, because that's knowledge then for you, not only to curate the output coming out of these models, but also to guide them with the text that you put into them. If you don't know about Corbusier, you're not gonna, you know, <laughs> that's not gonna factor into the architecture you produce. And so it's true when you look, I mean, just give it to your parents or, or someone, and they'll, they'll say Frank Lloyd Wright, a house by Frank Lloyd Wright, and it's gonna just be, you know, not that interesting. But you give it to an architecture student that's had a few theory classes, a few history classes, and start combining some of the things that they've learned, you'll get output that is really quite interesting and quite different than you would expect or that you would have probably come up without the tools. And so um, I do think there's still really important knowledge that we gain, and actually it's more important than ever that we gain that knowledge and, and become disciplinary and, 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 and still true to the things that we learn.
So, uh, so I'm a third year student. I have been applied DLE and Midjourney. Midjourney only do apply prompts to the uh, AI architecture, and that's the main core reason of why I'm staying here uh, to listen to a lecture. It's a productive, productive lecture, and you and you like organize the productions of the image really easily. What I'm really going to ask is about the world architecture one of your project, which like the gives like small image large boundaries. But I realized that some part of the uh, some part of the output pictures they does not uh, they, they does not make sense structurally on a very basis like perspective. And, also, and this makes me recall of my own like uh, outputs for the architect of the architecture output drawings. Some of them just does not make any sense to architectural tool structures, and the software engineers will just like bit bit into that and just ban it from the very start. So uh, my question is: uh, so it seems that according to your uh, your lecture, the the design the design of like uh, rendering a picture out from Dell E and stable diffusion is quite different from the human perspective. I guess that's part of the reason why like uh, it's structurally it's so weird and there's like a lot of problems. But, and how can we solve this? And what or when and when can we solve this? Yeah, I mean it's a really good point and it's true. And uh, I've done a few exercises where we've, we've tried to construct models of the images. Uh, so you see, I did the one house, you know, of the, the letters. But we've done it on a lot of projects. It's actually impossible on a lot of them. So forget structure, forget all of that. It's actually impossible just to model the image that you see in three dimensions. And that's because, because of the way it assembles these pixels, it might be taking it doesn't collage, so it doesn't take images, but it might be based on some image that's taken from a 50 millimeter lens, another one that's from a 22 millimeter lens, another one that's a two point perspective, and, a, and it, it assembles these things in a way that you can't reconstruct it based on a single view of like 50 millimeters, because it starts to tear, and you know, this piece is here, but it looks like it should be there, and then you start to model that, and it, it starts to drift. So that's one problem, is just literally extracting three-dimensional information from the 2D. But then the other thing is to not, I mean, I don't pretend that these are complete projects or designs. I think they're, they're sketches for ideas. And so they're just ideas that get generated with this process and through AI. But if I were to use them in, in real architecture, like we're trying to do with the ceiling, for example, they're really influential, but they're not the architecture itself. We still construct ideas based on the things we already know how to do, and things that we know will work for fabrication, will work for structure, will work for climate. And so we apply the principles where they make sense, and then we use the knowledge we have where it doesn't. Hi. Thanks for the lecture. Um, I just had a quick question. I noticed that in a lot of the examples that you've shown, so particularly large, large scale buildings, uh, they almost always have some level of vegetation to them, uh, typically like up high, and I'm curious if that like manual, and you guys are putting that in the prompt, or is that based on the image, or, or, or based on like, the data set, or how is that happening? So yeah, I, um, you know, it's interesting because I try to include as much text as possible in my prompt. Like, as my, I do paragraphs of, of text because as you go further in the curation, the variation, the upscaling, it'll pull in the text that it didn't previously use in the image. So probably my text cover, has something related to plants at some point, just simply because I have so much text. However. Um, it also understands features that you don't necessarily prompt as parts of architecture because of the data set. So there was a big problem for like a year within these programs where the output would come with watermarks, like it would say Shutterfly. And that's because it thought Shutterfly was part of a building. Like it thought that watermark was part of architecture because the data set, all the images it, it pulled had watermarks on them. And so it didn't understand that's not a window. It's, it like, you know, it's not a feature. So they had to remove that kind of condition. There's actually now you can you can prompt out plants because of the same problem, but maybe you know at least a little more sophisticated. Uh, but it's the same kind of issue where I think there's so much 
nature linked with architecture within the data set. It's just it assumes that it's there or should be there based on all of the data that it has. So you can remove it by saying no, no plants. You can actually negatively prompt it. Um, but it's, I think it's one of those things that just carries along with architecture because architecture tends to be in photographs directly linked with nature. And it doesn't really care if it's on the ground or on the building. It just knows because it's not, it's not assembling it with knowledge of ground or the sky. Right, it's just assembling it based on this feature connects to that feature, connects to this feature. So it could be working on building up here and know that building has plant and it puts plant on there. And so it's part of that too, where it just emerges from that understanding. Thanks, Corey. Um, uh, I really admire the willingness to kind of share all of the kind of in-progress work. It's not something that people are comfortable doing. Um, I have a kind of a general question about um, the approach that you take to adopting uh, any type of technology as it emerges onto the scene. And today I sense like an unbridled enthusiasm for like, Here, here's this thing. Let's see what it can do. Let's try it out. Let's try it out a lot. Um, and I think if I trace back what I remember and know about your previous work, I think there's that same level of enthusiasm. And I think that's why you've been able to be so productive when new technologies and new techniques emerge, because I think, I'm guessing, that you approach it with like, here's this thing, let's try it out. Um, I don't sense like suspicion or criticality, I mean, different level of criticality, but, or hesitation. And I can imagine why that would be paralyzing, because it would restrict one from producing in a, with unbridled enthusiasm. So I wonder if you could just reflect on like how, how the introduction of AI might be different from the introduction of other softwares or technologies or techniques, and um, if, if I'm missing something, like if there is a kind of suspicion or, or, or productive restriction or criticality with the use of what's still brand new. Yeah, great observation, I, I think you've nailed me. So <laughs> uh, there's a book I read at some point in grad school, I don't know, maybe Ed Keller gave it to me or someone, it was called uh, In the Blink of an Eye, by Walter Murch, and he's a film editor, and he did all the film on the waterfront, it was a lot of Hitchcock and stuff. And his approach was always to tell the director, make as much as possible, like just make 30 films, and then I'll find it in that, in that stuff. And like, it's a really good book, I mean, it just kind of talks about the process and stuff, but I've always embraced that. Like, I think, uh, that's why curation really sits well with me, because I, I'm okay editing, I like to edit. And so I'm fully absorbed in anything that comes out. I, I definitely don't. I'm like the only person who teaches this stuff and also supports Revit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah use it. Use whatever, use, use this, use that. I think the, the problem is when you um, don't do that, like when you just allow for one tool and then that's the tool that guides all your decision making. So it, the, the, the drawback is that it's hard to become fully expert on any one thing. Sure because it just takes so much time. Though, I think, think that's becoming less of an issue. Like my students now are doing um, processing drawings, like in, in processing, and what used to take me a year to teach them, just basic syntax, like draw a line and 95 line, you know, super simple things. They do in a week with, with, with ChatGPT. I mean, it's remarkable how far they get. Or we did a, a design build last semester, they don't know Arduino, they don't know light sensors, any of that stuff. And they, you know, ChatGPT wrote Arduino code, plugged it in in a week. I mean, it's remarkable, I think, what these tools are allowing us to do to the point where I think that that barrier of knowledge and expertise does start to get lowered. And I think this kind of approach where you're more absorbative of multiple approaches and technologies will become necessary. I think it'll become the norm because of its accessibility. As soon as it becomes accessible, more people use it. And then as more people use it, more people expect it. And as more people expect it, you have to use it. So I think there's going to be a, a kind of um, a moment where it just becomes part of the routine of working. So I hope, hopefully, so that's, that's a, you're exactly right. That's the kind of thing I take. I am, with, I'm very suspicious of things. I, I don't really convey that, but I, I, you know, I'm on the task force for, for the university now to how do we implement these things. And, you know, we're, we're talking now interesting conversations. I mean, the bias one's obvious. We've, we've talked yeah. about it. We, 
we have a whole chapter we've written for the university about it. There's major problems with the bias. Actually, if you're interested in that area, Andrew Cudless did a really good experiment um, where he did two prompts uh, for Japanese houses, one in Japanese, one in English. The English one was super stereotypical, like tourist images. The Japanese one was what a Japanese house would be like. And so language matters. I think part of it is how you access these models. What, you know, understanding what the data set is and avoiding those kind of pitfalls and, and making sure you're using the right approach to it. So that's one thing. Um, but the other thing is like maybe also modulating our ethics according to these things. So plagiarism is what we're talking about now. Plagiarism, the idea of it, is no longer the same as it was two years ago. And so all these university presidents are being brought down for plagiarism. That's an old model of plagiarism applied to them using new current technologies. And um, so we have to rethink it. I mean, what is plagiarism now? What are the ethic boundaries around it? How do you use ChatGP? We banned Turnitin. You're not allowed to use it on campus. Like, professors cannot use it uh, because it's not accurate. And it's not accurate enough, I should say. And so we need a new, by banning it, it forces us to have a new way of of understanding what it means to create your own original content or use these tools in combination with that. So I'm definitely skeptical, definitely concerned about those boundaries, but also in a way that we must deal with. Last year, there was reports about uh, like to, towards Del Delhi and other uh, and mid journey about suing them for uh, not applying specific kinds of like uh, kinds of architecture to the applications of the uh, output images, and, uh, and those are the those are all together with the a series of other com combinations about the, all the attack towards art morality or like uh, bias, like or total ban bans of the, yeah. the whole AI AI application of architecture. Yeah. Which uh, so what so what I was thinking of is like uh, maybe it's also because of these kinds of inaccuracy and randomness that stops like AI from becoming into of uh, taking part into the better processes of the uh, of the architecture of the architecture design program. And so this is a Rubicon mirror, and where can we go across it? Where can I see the AI, like the AI tools that may be applied to the like the finalizing ideas and final process of producing architecture. Okay, I think I yeah, I think it's a really good um, question. I think this is really critical: is that we need to start um, creating discipline-specific models. And so the problem with the bias, the problem with the, the problem with, with the existing models is that they're tagged as generically as possible. And this goes back to Mario Carpo questions. Of, Specificity versus general, uh, general. Um, and how you know you would argue that now we're in a world because of computers where you can search for exact information. You don't have to classify things, categorize things. You can just get the thing you need. AI models are super generic, which is unfortunate. So windows are windows. You know, like architecture. As as designers, windows might be doors. Windows might not be windows that are tagged generically within an AI model by some non-disciplined person. So um, it, it will be important, I think, more so now moving forward that we start creating our own models, appending these models. Like Co-op Hemelblau is already doing it where they have their own you know, model that attaches to stable diffusion and that has their own projects and they can create Co-op Hemelblau buildings. Maybe that's not the right way to do it, <coughs> but we might be more specific uh, um, on how we understand the elements of architecture. Like windows might not be windows, there might be different kinds of windows, there might be um, a whole range of tagging that just involves windows because we have so much to say about them. So that could be true of all these kind of elements and so that when you're working in these models you know certain text will um, bring to the forefront certain kinds of architectural elements designed in certain ways as opposed to relying so much on the model. So I think that's that's kind of the future of it, and um, you know, like 
part of what we need to be careful of is, our, I mean, I think 80% of the bias coming in these models actually our own biases, whether they're it, whatever. But um, we, and it goes back to my point about learning more history, learning more, more, having more knowledge so that you can expand your own architectural vocabulary and then go beyond your comfort level or what you've been trained in in a particular way. So part of it is doing that as well. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. <laughs> and yeah, if you do have more questions for Corey, you can come. I'll be around.